Ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege of introducing Professor Richard Mollett. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one, one quick note on next Wednesday, Jorge Ramon Hernandez is the Honduran ambassador to the United States. Uh, as some of you may know, in recent years, drug trafficking patterns have moved and 90% of the cocaine coming to the U.S. goes through Central America and most of that through Honduras. And one result has been the Central American presidents have begun talking about the need to recast, rechange our drug policy. So this could be an absolutely fascinating time. These luncheons, which we tend to do most months, uh, are very informal, you know. Brief, brief remarks by our guests, but a great chance to ask questions, interact uh, with somebody at one of the cutting edges of one of the critical issues facing our society today. So if you're interested, make sure Ron knows it, and uh, he's, he's working on, on exactly where we're going to have it. It'll be in his building someplace. He'll let you know. <laughs> um, my topic today, oh boy. Now, I, I usually like to open my talks with a joke. That's something I've learned in my years teaching at the war colleges. But it's hard to find a joke about this topic. And the topic in general, especially when it's done with a good old alphabet soup the military loves, DDR and SSR, sounds about as exciting as a lecture on the mosquito's left eyebrow. Uh, but it's really incredibly important. And it reflects several things that I'm going to talk about that have changed in the world. Bluntly, it, it's something that has left the American public hopelessly far behind, and has left much of the academic world way behind. The textbooks are really bad on this, to be as blunt as I can be. We spent so many years, understandably, worried about how you negotiate the ends of wars. How do you negotiate? And forgetting that ending the formal fighting doesn't necessarily end the violence of conflict. Now, I really became aware of this in my trips to Washington, D.C. I'm, I'm essentially bilingual in Spanish. And I, uh, every restaurant, every hotel in Washington is full of people from El Salvador. Washington, D.C. has become the second largest city of El Salvador. Uh, and you talk to them, and they discover that you know their country, and you know, you, you know, you, I even had one of them go home and bring me back some Salvadoran food to the hotel. You know, they, they really appreciate this. But they're pretty blunt with you, and they tell me that, hey, you know, it is more dangerous for me to go back to my country now than it was during the height of the Civil War. You say, huh? They say, oh, yes, you know, in the Civil War, you know, it, it, it might get stopped here, but you know, if you were out of politics, it, now, they'll stop you for anything, and they might kill you for your shoes. <laughs> there are more military patrols between the airport and the capital city now than there were at the height of the Civil War. When I was last in El Salvador about a year and a half ago, I literally had an armed escort from both the airport in and out. What we've discovered is that ending wars is never enough. That's the first line of my forthcoming book, incidentally. It's not enough. We used to talk about post-conflict societies, but as a, a really good friend of mine, Dr. and Colonel Michael Jajic, long time with the U.S. Institute of Peace and co-author of two of the most important books on this, including one called Policing the New World Disorder, he simply says, Post-conflict, I hate that term. The conflict's not over. <laughs> you know, the formal fighting may be, but the conflicts go on. This represents several things. First of all, traditionally, when you thought about wars and conflicts, you thought about conflicts between nation states, which in many ways could be negotiated <laughs> more easily which didn't necessarily involve, although when we look at World War II, it's different, the total devastation of the states involved, which were political negotiations, and which often meant, especially if you didn't have an imposed settlement because of an overwhelming victory, like we did in World War II. You know, 
often meant that, that you had little responsibility for what happened after the war in their territory, and they didn't have any for what happened after the war in yours. But today, the overwhelming majority of conflicts are within a nation. They are civil conflicts. And yet at the same time, hardly any of them are confined to the borders of a single nation. They spill over. I did an entire small book for the North-South Center at the University of Miami on the spillover effects of Columbia's conflicts, how it affected every nation on Columbia's borders, all of them in different ways. This, you know, you know, the only place I think you could have a, a purely national civil war today might be in Iceland. <laughs> Fortunately, borders on nothing. But, you know, essentially, these things always spill over. And what really complicates them is when you have religious and ethnic groups that spill over the borders as well. This produces very difficult situations. It means that you have supplies and sanctuaries which governments may have very little to do with, may in fact often be unable to control. The, the classic case for us today, of course, is Pakistan, Afghanistan. You know, look at that. Pakistan has never effectively controlled that border. And in many ways, the last thing in the world the Pakistani military wants to do is make their major effort up there. First of all, they're focused on India, not on that. But secondly, now that, that, that is a lose-lose situation. We have a, our good officer here from the ROTC program who was in Pakistan. Am I right about that area? Yeah, he, he can tell you about it more if you're interested in it. But this is, this is really, we, we started using the words ungoverned spaces. Yet the problem again is that's not a good term because there's always a government of some sort there. It's just not the national government. It may be a government run by local warlords, as we like to call them. It may be a government run by extreme religious factions. Maybe a government run by organized crime. But there's some sort of a state there. It's just not the national state that governs it. You know, and technology plays a role here. It, it used to be that if you had dissident elements, be they political or ethnic, or, you know, and you drove them into these outlying frontier areas, you didn't care what they did out there. That didn't matter. You never controlled that anyway. It didn't have much impact on your economy. Nobody went there. You know, If they were out of control out there, they were also out of touch. And then we reached the point in the world today you know, where bin Laden could sit in a cave on the Afghan-Pakistan border and make a phone call to Brooklyn. <laughs> Nothing is out of touch anymore. In fact, the areas out of control can become ideal places for terrorist, criminal elements to locate. Because they can operate from there with minimal fear of government intervention. One of our reactions to that, of course, has been the use of drones, which I'm not going to get into today. <laughs> technology feeds technology feeds technology. This is, you know, we used to have advertisements when we had the old mobile, you know, this is not your grandfather's old mobile. Well, I'll tell you, this isn't your father's war. <laughs> this isn't your father's society. This is a world where some of the rules have been so basically transformed. Let me give you another example, and this is a very important one for what we're going to get into here. During the Cold War, especially, insurgent movements, the guerrillas, you know, et cetera, tended often to be finance supported by states, especially neighboring states. And these things, when these wars were over ideology, over politics, you know, those who gave the support, the money, the guns, etc., the training, did it through the political leadership of these movements, and these movements could then control the guys with the guns on the ground. Well, we thought with the end of the Cold War, we had good news. You know, this is the ultimate good news, bad news joke. I love good news, bad news jokes. I hate to tell you that. One of, one of my favorites is the guy who's in the terrible auto accident. The doctor comes in and says, oh, I have bad news, but I have good news. Oh, what's the bad news? 
Your legs are hopelessly crushed, and we have to amputate them both at the knee. Ah! What's the good news? I have a friend who wants to buy all your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we call an equitable arrangement. <laughs> Well, you know, we thought the good news was states are getting out of this business, and they are, despite a lot of the political rhetoric you hear. You know, states are largely out of this business, and the ones that are in it is not, not nearly as central. What's the bad news? Uh, Scott's joke. These guys did not go gentle into that good night. You know, they turned to crime to raise money. But when you raise money by crime, the guys with the guns get the money. And the political leadership, such as it may be in Exxon, loses most of its control over them. It depends on them for money. They don't depend on it. And when each local unit, each bunch of guys with guns, raises their own money, we say is it inverts the command and control paradigm. Yeah, you know, suddenly, you know, it's not the guys at the political top that run things, it's the guys at the bottom level that run things. And this makes negotiating any agreement incredibly difficult. You add to that the fact that when it's an ethnic or religious dispute, it's also very, very difficult. I, I, uh, I used to give lectures to the Marines on uh, guerrilla warfare, you know, and I'd always ask the same question. What's the longest lasting insurgency in the world? Now, I taught it here at SIU, nobody could answer it. You know, I did it at the University of Miami, nobody could answer it. I'm out in the backwoods of Camp Pendleton, and this Marine sergeant leaps up and says, Sir, that would be the Moros in the Philippines, sir. I wanted to give that guy a gold star in the middle of his forehead. Somebody finally knew it. These guys started fighting Magellan <laughs> when he landed there for the Spanish. <laughs> yeah. Fought them, the Spanish for hundreds of years, fought us, fought the Japanese. <laughs> and are fighting the Philippine government. I got a notice yesterday that they are actually now talking about some kind of negotiation to give them some autonomous, autonomous rule. We call these people Moros, incidentally, you know, out in the island of Mindanao and a few of the other islands of the Philippines. But this guerrilla war has been going on for over 500 years. And it's a combination of ethnic and religious because the Moros are Islamic. Five hundred years. Yeah. That's a long, long time. And these memories last. There's a, I have a, as a principle, you know, that, that hate has a much longer shelf life than gratitude. <laughs> People remember hate a lot. I remember watching a TV show during the, the height of the Balkans conflict, and one of the Serbian soldiers who was besieging Sarajevo, and somebody asked him, "What are you doing?" He said, "Well, I'm killing Turks." There hadn't been a Turk in Sarajevo in three, four hundred years. <laughs> it didn't matter. The Muslims were still Turks. He was still fighting the battles of the 16th century. <laughs> Hate has a longer shelf life than gratitude. So you take all of these, you've got civil conflicts, you've got ethnic and religious elements, you've got crime as a major source of funding. And as a result, the intrusion of transnational criminal groups what on earth do you do when it comes to ending wars? Well, the big topic today in much of international circles at the UN, in good parts of the US military, in NATO, is what we call DDR and SSR. Oh boy, don't you love alphabet soup? Especially DDR, that was a lot of fun because that was the initials for the old East German country, you know, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik. <laughs> so you talk about DDR, people thought you were talking about East Germany and wonder why you were still worried about that. Uh, the first D, and it has to come first, disarmament. The second D, demobilization. And the third, the R, and the R can have several things. The key one is reintegration, but it can also mean reconciliation, all sorts, you know. So, disarmament, demobilization, reintegration. And then the SSR, which is linked to it, 
this is pretty simple here, security sector reform. What do you do with the army and the police, if anything? And successful DDR often depends on SSR. Now, one of the things we learned was if you don't do something with this at the end of a war, if you don't address the issues included here, and I'm going to talk about them, then the war may never end. And our key example here is Somalia. One of the interesting debates, especially between the UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali and both Presidents Bush and Clinton, was you guys can't just go in and start feeding people. You, know, you, you need to deal with disarming me. And we didn't agree at first. And the results were Black Hawk Down, for those of you who've seen that movie or read the book, which incidentally I highly recommend the book, very informed. It's, it's one of those rare things where both the people in the operation whom I know and those who had, you know, just total outsiders who like the good read all agreed it was a good, it was a, a very good study of the case. And the movie's pretty good. Black Hawk Down, on the downing of the U.S. helicopter. Helicopters were, you know, in Somalia. And we didn't do this. We left Somalia with no DDR, SSR, obviously. And if you've noticed, it hasn't exactly been paradise since. Among other things, it became the world center for piracy. It became a place where a militant Islamic group almost took power. This is, and this, you see a similar parallel. We left Afghanistan with no DDR and, and you know, total disorder, chaos, and in comes an extremely militant Islamic group promising order. <laughs> it's called the Taliban there. <laughs> so we, you know, you look at these examples and you say, hmm, <laughs> maybe, maybe we shouldn't just quit once we've got the peace treaty signed. Maybe there's something beyond that that we have to deal with. And that brings us up to DDR. There's another factor here that, again, when you know, people don't stop and think about it, 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 some of the most important things, the things that are standing there staring you in the face and nobody mentions. And one of them is the fact that who's been doing this fighting? I'm not talking about who's been the political leaders. Who's been doing the shooting? Who are the guys with the gun? And the answer is they're overwhelmingly young, testosterone-dominated males who've never had another job. <laughs> the only thing they know how to do is kill people. In fact, one of the big issues, especially, but not exclusively in Africa, is the use of child soldiers. Literally recruiting you know, kids as young as 12 years old or even younger, you know, giving them an automatic weapon, loading them up with drugs and sending them out to kill people. What do you do with these guys? What on earth do you do with these young males? Because the other effect of these conflicts, especially the ones that have gone on for years, and most of them seem to have done that, is that the economies are devastated. There are jobs. <laughs> there often is very little available land. The infrastructure is badly destroyed. So suddenly you say, hey, the war is over, you know. Uh, all you guys in the, in the guerrillas, whatever you were, and probably two-thirds of the military, which is out there fighting the guerrillas, you know. You all go home. There's no jobs. There's no food. Uh, but you probably will take your gun with you. How many of you think that's a recipe for peace, stability, and harmony? <laughs> now you see again what the first step is of this is disarmament. So you've, you've got societies which in many ways are wrecked. Societies which may have incredibly deep ethnic and religious divisions. Uh, one, one of the things we, we talked about an awful lot, especially in the, in the 80s, I, I worked on a lot of these negotiations in Central America in the 80s and early 90s. You know. And you talked a lot about confidence building measures, CBMs, more alphabet soup. <coughs> How do you slowly develop confidence between the two sides? Well, that meant confidence between the leaderships. 
didn't have anything to do with the guy at the bottom of the you know, with the AK-47 in his hands. <laughs> If it was an international war, it meant, again, between the elected government, or whatever kind of governments they were. But the problem in these things, and again, especially when they've been ethnic and religious, is that what you have is the absolute opposite of confidence down at the lowest levels. There's a Spanish word that's so much better than English, I just love it here. It's called desconfianza. We could, we could translate that as unconfidence, except there's no English word called unconfidence. <laughs> so we translate it as distrust, which is incredibly weak. Disconfianza goes to your soul. It goes to the very nature of where you are. <laughs> it is profound, and it is lasting. And there is a level of disconfianza <laughs> among these people. Why not? Remember to this, you also add the fact that a lot of these are pretty traditional societies, which means the most important part is the extended family, which means there's a very good chance that somebody in your family was killed, assaulted, raped by somebody on the other side. The victims are so often women and children. And again, here's another thing. You may deal with the fighters. What do you do with all the women? with all the children, with all the orphans? What do you do with these victims who are every much as much a victim as anyone, perhaps more, and who could often be? You, know, you, you find, interestingly enough, that women's groups emerge in some of these cases. They did in Northern Ireland. They did in Liberia, you know, to demand an end to this endless, wasteful murder. These societies of ingrained violence. Ah. Beginning to see the dimensions of the problem? You're beginning to see why ending the war is not enough? Does this begin to add up? I hope so. You know, one of the things I've discovered, interestingly enough, is that every week, and I'm not exaggerating, I get two, three, four announcements of jobs in this field where they're looking for people. Of course, they're often looking for them to go to someplace nice like Kabul, which may limit the number of applicants. Uh, but they, they are desperately looking for people with some knowledge, hopefully some experience, in dealing with these kinds of issues. Demo, let's talk about disarmament first of all. Let's, let's start with the D. What you want to do is get the combatants drawn together someplace and begin to take away the weapons. Now this doesn't apply usually to the government forces particularly, although there may be something here. But it applies to guerrillas, you know, whatever kind of insurgency you've had. There's a couple principles here. A, they will never honestly turn in all their weapons. <laughs> B, they will never turn them all in at once. <laughs> and C, there are some kinds that scare you a lot more than others, notably surface-to-air missiles, especially the US. <laughs> when these things have been out there, why do we care about what happens to them? Anybody? Why would you care? You know, why would you care a lot more about a, a a Sam or a red eye or whatever. Yeah, it is. Why would you care about these? Yeah. Well, uh, surface air missile has capability to take down civilian airliners going hundreds of civilians. Oh, yeah. Rifles yeah. not going to Any be. terrorist can use it on a civilian aircraft. And you know, you got again guys with these things totally broke, desperate. You think they might sell them? I could talk to the man who was the U.S. ambassador in Liberia about his efforts to buy these things. <laughs> People would come in offering this up. They heard he was buying them. You know, that may have been the best word he could put out. And he wound up buying quite a few. <laughs> it went for the average poor Liberian veteran of this multi-sided chaos. In some countries, it's so chaotic, like in Liberia, you, can, you disarm everybody. 
because it's hard to tell who the heck the government was. <laughs> it just dissolved the old government. No. But it's a complicated, it, it takes a lot of patience. You know, they'll turn in some and wait to see what happens. You know, wait to see if the government keeps some of its promises. Wait to see if the international presence can enforce these things. Because that's something else that's usually necessary is you bring in an international and outside force, UN, NATO. In Africa, sometimes it was the Organization of African Unity, or what we call ECOWAS. Don't you love the Appalachian soup? <laughs> something that was never designed for this, the Economic Community of West African States, <laughs> it suddenly found itself doing this, mostly with Nigerian and Ghanaian troops. An international force that can put itself between these two. But that, again, is never enough. We discovered something very much in Bosnia, and having an international force there under highly restrictive conditions, where it's, uh, it, it's fun as a historian, which I really am, although no one believes it, <coughs> you know, to look back on these things. We've got terms like rules of engagement, you know, that didn't exist before. Yeah. We talk about those. <laughs> but we do now. You better know what three rules of engagement are, right? You know, when can you use force and when can you not? And for the UN for years, it could only be if the UN peacekeepers were attacked. So when the Serbs went to Srebrenica, dragged out all the young Bosnian males and killed them, the Dutch peacekeepers, who were supposed to be protecting these people, had to stand there and watch. It's created a crisis in the Netherlands, a crisis in NATO and a crisis in the UN, and it led to some changes in the rules. Whereas now these people can use force not only to protect themselves. They've gone from what we call peacekeeping, often when there was no peace to keep, to peacemaking. These are two different chapters of the UN Charter, the Security Council, which gives them literally the right to force an end to fighting, to forcefully uphold some of the terms of whatever peace agreement has been made. So you get an international presence here. And they will usually be in charge of the disarmament because, again, who trusts the government? Does the government trust the group? Nobody trusts anybody. You've got to have a third party there. Once you've gotten a fair way along in disarmament, remember, it's never complete. Some of the stuff's just going to be buried, you know. It, what you really hope is the ammunition degrades kind of fast. <laughs> uh, you go to demobilization. All right, you guys, now we're going to send you all home. The war is over, you know. Again, we'll do this in stages. And often we'll give you some money, especially if you just turned in a weapon. <laughs> we'll pay you to turn in a weapon. Um, and we'll have nice programs for you. Again, this gets interesting. If the people come largely from one ethnic area and can and largely go back to it, they won't be facing the kind of hatred they might face if they were in the other area. But if these areas, and this would often happen if the fight's religious, you know, are totally intermixed, it gets much more difficult. Um, we're going to try to find you jobs. Demobilization. This gets into reintegration. We're going to make lots of promises to you. Maybe you'll have a special safe haven area. That happened in Nicaragua. The problem is governments are often much more willing to make promises than they are able to keep them. Does that remind you of other human beings? I'm sure you've never encountered anyone like that, have you? No. <laughs> it's, no. Promises are easy to make and hard to keep, right? And the governments may promise just about, and it's not so much that they're consciously lying. Often they say, yes, we'll do all of this because we expect the world to fund it. And the world says, war's over. Let's see now what's going on over. <laughs> As the, you know, right now, once you begin to demobilize these people, your need for funds for international support goes like this. The very simple graph. <laughs> yeah. 
your need for funding goes like this, and the world's providing funding goes like this. The term we use is that international funding is usually front-loaded. You know, comes in more at the top and just goes down. And in a world economy like today's, it's gotten much worse. First of all, the number of these projects keeps going up, and they tend to last a long time. Secondly, can you picture the U.S. President, the British Prime Minister, virtually any world leader going to his Parliament, Congress, whatever, and saying, by the way, I would like you to appropriate $500 million to create jobs over there. What do you think the chances of getting that passed would be? A little less than your chances of putting the toothpaste back in the toothpaste tube. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Are there reasons it would really be in our interest to do it? Yeah. In the long run, could it really be cost effective for us? Yes. Are we going to do it? No. If I see one political ad urging us to spend more money on this kind of stuff in this election cycle, you know, I will know that we have reached the end of the age and Jesus will return any hour now. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's one, if you will, of the weaknesses of the democratic system, which has a lot more strength than weakness. But it has these kinds of things. Short-range issues tend to overrun long-range concerns. The world ends at the next election. One of the other things you're dealing with while you're dealing with this thing is that SSR. Security Sector Reform. It has three elements that are distinct but interrelated. And important. The first, of course, is what do you do with the armies? Now this often means, A, a considerable downsizing of the national army, if there is a national army there. In Nicaragua, the army literally downsized by almost 90% over a couple of years. Of course, part of it was, as soon as the fighting ended, half the draftees in the army went home anyway. They didn't even ask for it, they just left. <laughs> Which made it easier to keep those promises. Secondly, the government's can't begin to, you know, some of these governments have gotten outside support for these armies. That happened, you know, we were supporting them in El Salvador. You got some Russian-Cuban support in Nicaragua. And believe me, when the war ended, that support went zip. <laughs> I think governments can't begin to afford these guys anymore. So they suddenly have to demobilize huge amounts of people and figure out what to do with them. <clears throat> and they've got a big both sides, but especially the government here have got a lot of people who are disabled, who've been wounded. What do you do with them? How do you support them in a bankrupt society? Something the world needs to pay a little more attention to. So, first of all, how do you downsize the army? In some rare cases, you may even integrate some of the guerrillas into the army. More likely is the step two, which is called, what do you do with the police? And you need to understand just how incredibly important the police are in most of these conflicts. First of all, in most of these countries, the police are not local, they're national. There's not much of anything in the way of local police. It's a national. And it's often a semi-militarized police force. In some cases, it was part of their Department of Defense. The police are the ones that are going to have contact with the population day by day. They are often brutal, corrupt, mistrusted, especially by the former guerrillas. Yeah. The governments are often more willing to integrate guerrillas into the police than the army because they don't see this as a threat to being overthrown later or something. Sometimes you can say, okay, we're going to give you essentially control over the police in this region where you are the strongest and, you know, put your people in there. So that your people who say, you know, your ethnic group will have police that they distrust less, <laughs> trust more. And then you need to get rid of a lot of the old police. <laughs> and to get new ones or to keep the old ones, another good word, I'll just put it on top of this one.
I'm just curious, how many of you know what this means? Talk about the vetting process. Seriously, I kind of figured it wasn't too many. <laughs> that's unfortunate, because that's an awfully important idea. What does it mean? It means, how do you check out these guys? How do you get rid of the ones who were murderers, thieves, you know? rapists? The records aren't exactly wonderful. The government records aren't exactly totally reliable. The gorilla's testimony isn't great either. <laughs> How do you vet these people? This is one of the interesting areas where you find promises and reality off the colliding. You know, it's, oh yes, we will give you people all a chance to join the police. We just vetted you, and 98% of you didn't qualify. <laughs> but you've got to do it. Who's going to do it? To, can the international presence, UN, whatever, can it have a role in this? It can, but it's going to be a difficult role because it's going to run right into local entrenched political interests. Everybody wants their political partisan, their religious partisan, their ethnic person, their brother-in-law to get the job. This is not something which promotes what we could call objectivity. <laughs> it is incredibly difficult. It's difficult at the higher levels. What do you do with the officers? And it's difficult at the lower levels. What we've also found is that those who get rejected in this process, those who are often the worst, you know, you don't have this, this is about getting in. We, usually there's an amnesty as part of the peace agreement, so you aren't going to try these guys for whatever they've done or been accused of. So what do they do? They've just lost their job in the police. They can't get in the new police. They, what are they going to do? They have two choices. One, of course, is to become a criminal, which a lot of them will choose. But the other choice, and this especially is true, is called Start a private security company. The biggest growth interest industry, the biggest source of new employment in many of these countries are private security companies. In fact, we have a nasty term for what goes with this called the privatization of security. You know, the police are weak and incompetent, often now new and untrained. Violence is everywhere, everybody's got a gun. So you hire a private security company somewhere, run by a former thug, you know, who is not going to be too careful about. And are the police going to rush out and investigate these guys first? No. <laughs> they, if anything, are doing part of the police job. Now, they may be doing it rather indiscriminately. They don't have to worry about collecting evidence. And the government pays very little attention to them. In part because it doesn't have the resources. And the situation can be so desperate. So different from what we're used to. Okay, and then there's the third aspect, and this is where, bluntly, the world tends to really fall down everywhere. And that's called the courts and prisons. <laughs> you know, you can negotiate things about the armies, you can negotiate things about the police, but the judges, the lawyers, the prisons, that gets, <coughs> that gets much more difficult. Who's going to be a judge? <laughs> Who understands the law? Who's going to protect the judges? <coughs> especially when you have rampant international crime, especially drug dealers. Judges are incredibly vulnerable. You become an honest judge, you also have an early funeral. The line of applicants for that position is rather short. If 
it's ethnic and religious. Are you going to have only somebody from the majority ethnic group become a judge? That, that happened in Kosovo, and one of the problems was there's no justice for the Serbian minority that's left. At least they don't believe there's any. <laughs> of course, when there were Serbian judges, there was no justice for the Albanian majority. Does a Shia want a Sunni judge? Sunni want a Shia judge? Kurd want anybody but a Kurdish judge? How are you going to deal with this? I had a chance a few years ago to talk to, bluntly, one of the senior U.S. generals in Afghanistan. We were talking about this. And he was saying, yeah, you know, we've, uh, we've done a pretty good job with the Afghan military. He said, but boy, the police hit nowhere. And the courts are impossible. We just, we have no control. <laughs> that's, that's not our function. You can be there as a foreign military force, but as long as you've got a domestic government, they're going to run the courts. <laughs> so even if you can reform the army, reform the police, you're stuck with an unworkable court system often, and with prisons that are the major postgraduate school for future criminals. We were at a presentation for the U.S. Southern Command in Miami, and we had a presentation by the former head of Columbia's National Police, and he was doing PowerPoint. I probably, I could have, but I resisted. <laughs> now, um, and he had his slides about the sources of crime. You know, where does crime come from? And number four on his slide, I love this, as a source of crime was the prisons. <laughs> it wasn't there on the cure side, it was there on the sources side. This is where the criminals come from. This was the guy who was the head of the National Police Force. And he was absolutely right. We're running short of time, so let me quickly get into the R, the reintegration. As I said, this is where things really get tough. How are you going to find jobs for these people? What are you going to do? How are you going to keep them from going into crime? How are you going to keep, this is one of the things that's created the incredible explosion of, of, of street <coughs> gangs in Central America. One thing we found out, we're going to go out, we're going to give them training programs. We're going to have all sorts of educational programs. Oh, boy. <laughs> Good idea. I like education, yes. But there's a few minor problems here. I, I had more fun looking at this thing in Haiti, a country, unfortunately, I know fairly well. Yeah? And we set up this big program, and we enrolled almost all the old Haitian army in it, you know? And they went, most of them got through their classes and graduated, you know. They were paid while they were in it. Oh, it was wonderful. We graduated, you know, six, seven thousand people from these classes. And then found jobs for 500. Whoops. <laughs> you know, Discover International Groups, be our domestic political groups, always want to give you the good statistics. You know, tell you all about the people who graduate. They don't want to talk about the number who later got jobs. First of all, they didn't pick the course they wanted. The biggest one they picked was auto mechanics in a country that has few cars and almost no roads. <laughs> no jobs. Oh, that's a little bit of a hole. What do you do with a child soldier? Put them back to school. Now, sometimes you could find relatives and families. A lot of times you can't. Some of these kids bluntly have become sociopaths. <laughs> If you don't think that experience would make you into one. <laughs> they need desperate psychological help. That's not exactly a ready commodity in most of these places. What about land reform? They had a big program of that in Nicaragua. They were going to put all the old contras in these wonderful areas. And it was a couple minor problems. There was no road. <laughs> there was no electricity. There weren't any schools. <laughs> so guess what? Within a year, about 80% of them had left these areas, gone into the urban areas where, there, again, there was no giant, and often become, you guessed it, criminals. <laughs> or some of them just retook up arms again, and we have what we call the recontras. Interestingly enough, as did part of the former army, so we have what we call the recompas as well. When they mixed together, we had the revueltos, which is the term you use for scrambled eggs. Uh, <laughs> Nice idea, but land alone isn't enough. 
the problem is, again, these guys are no longer simple peasants used to living in a subsistence economy. The wars. We, we had an old phrase from World War, old song called, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Curry, after they've seen Paris? And the answer, how are you going to keep these guys out in the middle of nowhere, you know, after they've been fighting like this for the last five, ten years? Reintegration is where you desperately need international help. And so they said, there's your funding chart. Well, let me sum up very quickly, and then like, and hopefully we've got time for questions, yeah, because that's important. You know. First of all, the character of wars and therefore peace agreements has changed dramatically since the end of the Cold War. Secondly, ending the war is never enough. Because you have, these are mostly civil conflicts, often with ethnic and religious dimensions. You have deeply divided and often economically devastated societies. You have a whole generation that has grown up knowing nothing but violence as a trade. You have guns available everywhere, and you have the increasing involvement of international criminal organizations and terrorist groups who find these kind of devastated societies often the best place to set up. You have the world paying much more attention to it. You have the focus of UN, NATO, other peacekeeping operations increasingly looking at things like DDR and its related SSR because experiences in places like Somalia and Afghanistan have underlined what happens if you don't do anything about this. But you have a major funding crisis. You can have what can essentially be called almost moral exhaustion. You know, one more war, one more crisis, one more. Where the world is short of funds, short of political will. And finally, the thing I didn't talk about, you have real, real problems domestically, including rampant corruption in governments, failing judicial systems, things with which the world community has yet to find any effective way to deal. These are the issues that are becoming dominant in much of the world today. These are the things which will determine the shape of the future along much of the globe. And yet it is something about which we know so little and devote such minimal resources. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, anyone uh, still awake? Time for questions for those who are still awake, and let's just go around and yeah. take, like, make the call. Thank you first. Um, sure. Uh, you talked a lot about the like, examples of where conflict hasn't been really solved after the war. Oh, yeah. Um, can you give us an example of what, maybe where conflict was? Well, where has this result? worked the best? And that's always a good question. Um, one thing the world likes to point to is El Salvador, you know, where the, you know, there has been peace, literally a, a functioning democratic process. The former guerrillas representative won the last presidential election. The problem is it also has one of the world's worst crime problems. Remember, this is the place where the, you know, it is. <coughs> so the process has worked up to a point and so The problem, again, is the, demobil the disarmament and demobilization worked pretty well, and the reintegration has been the Achilles heel. They've actually really reintegrated the police. Uh, Nicaragua, to an extent, because the police work there in the court, and uh, because they've had much less involvement by transnational crime, partly because it's been so easy to just go north. Uh, but... Uh, it's getting worse. Things are starting to, there's a huge traveling going on in Nicaragua, uh, which involves international drug smuggling, which has been a lot of fun to watch if anybody wants to dig it out on the net. Um, in Africa, Mozambique up to a point again. Uh, Angola was kind of a strange one because essentially it was an imposed settlement. You know, there was, in, in several countries you had different periods of this. We tried it once in Haiti and it fell totally apart. We're trying it again in Haiti, and I'm not sure anything works in Haiti, but to the extent, you know, especially not when an earthquake comes along. Um, Angola, the army, you know, the, the first period thing fell totally apart, and then you killed the head of the guerrillas, and essentially the government was able to pretty much impose the terms. With men, there was an international force there, but with very little, I mean, presence there, better way of putting it, but with little authority. It was, uh, it's worked. It helps that Angola's got oil. It helps that most of Angola's urban areas <coughs> didn't really get damaged. It, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of factors. 
Mozambique, again, is an interesting case. Uh, <coughs> Sierra Leone and Liberia are, oh Lord, talk about coming late to the dance. <laughs> you know, these countries, Sierra Leone especially, just incredible brutality. Some of the stuff we see now going on in Uganda and other places with them. This relative success, uh, the least successful, uh, Afghanistan, a total failure, Iraq, uh, the, the efforts just never got off the ground in part because no part of the U.S. government wanted to take ownership of them. Nobody said, this is my job. Uh, and the Iraqis didn't, you know, the Shias didn't want to do anything for the Sunnis, and the Sunnis didn't want to do anything for the Shias, and the Kurds wanted both of them to go away. Uh, this was, uh, this is the problems of a deeply divided society. Bosnia, perhaps one of the more successful ones. Uh, it's, there's, they're all partial, the, actually the title of my, the Searching for Stability is the book I did before on the U.S. training of other people's armies. You put in my name, Millet, M-I-L-L-E-T-T, -T, plus Searching for Stability, the whole book will pop up and you can download it free. <laughs> uh, this one is actually called uh, Partial Success and Return, Recurring Frustrations. You know, this is, uh, because every success is partial. And the biggest problems are at the end part. There's a lot of problems in security sector reform, again, especially when you get to the courts and things. There's a lot of problems in reintegration. And it, 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 it just go, it, it, this takes a long time. Uh, Bosnia is helped by the fact that it's essentially in Europe, so that people can immigrate out and get jobs. And it, it's more educated. And it, it, it's got these incredibly deep divisions, but they've managed to pretty much eliminate the violence. It's been a long, slow process in Bosnia. Uh, because because it's in Europe, Europe's been more interested and more involved, and stayed involved longer, uh, getting the world to stay involved. And stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's a great question. And, it's, uh, and the answer is there are no complete successes, and there are very few total failures. Uh, it's, it's, and, uh, and when does this thing reach an end? And the answer is, is oh no. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Anything else? Yeah? Is it dangerous for Americans to travel to El Salvador and then what's causing the crime? What about El Salvador? Is it dangerous for Americans to travel there? Depends. <laughs> uh, is it dangerous for you to walk down the street with a big video camera? At night, and the answer is of course. Is it dangerous to walk down some parts of St. Louis and Street at night with a big video camera? And the answer is sure. Uh, it's, um, El Salvador. El Salvador has done something very interesting in the past few months, and that is that bluntly the government has, with the help of the Catholic Church, very quietly, essentially negotiated some arrangements with the street gangs. And the, the violence level has gone down significantly, not gone away. Um, but uh, would this make it much safer for foreigners? And the answer is not necessarily. Yeah, you know, I'm in Salvador, what do I do? I don't go places alone. I go with friends. I, I speak the language perfectly. I know where to go and where not to go. You know, it, it, uh, we were warned about going out for dinner. We went out for dinner anyway, because we got to, you know, again, it's like a taxi. You only take a taxi that's registered from the hotel. You don't grab one on the street, because there's no telling where you're going to go then. Uh, it's probably to your friendly ATM machine. Uh, <laughs> um, relative. I mean, and there, and there are parts of every place that are worse than others. Uh, it's like Mexico, you know, good grief. There are parts of Mexico, I would not go to Juarez, I would, you know, on a bet. I wouldn't go to much of the frontier. I, I do occasionally, you know, I'm really, there, there. Yeah, on the other hand, there are parts, I have to go to Bahia, the Guanajuato, Querétaro, to go to Yucatan, although stay away from Cancun, <laughs> you know, to go to Huatulco, but stay away from Acapulco. The cruise ships have stopped going to Acapulco. <laughs> There are places that are not safe and places that are. You know, it's it's very wild. Baja California, because it's not on the route anywhere. You know, the southern part of Baja is still you know, quite safe. It's, it all depends. Uh, and depends on where you are, what you do when you get there. Uh, you need a few street smarts. Um, like Colombia. Colombia now is much safer than it was a few years. Uh, I'm going to Cartagena with my wife in December. Would not have taken her any place in Columbia five, ten years ago. Uh, 
still places I probably wouldn't take it, but I, yeah, I'll go back. I, you know, 10 years ago, if I flew, when I flew to Bogota, I got met by the army at the airport. <laughs> Not now. Uh, it, it all depends. Uh, Ecuador is safe, relatively speaking. Again, but much safer in the highlands than down on the coast. Stay away from Esmeraldas. Uh, stay away from border areas, for goodness sakes. <laughs> These can be wild west and then some. Uh, so, yeah, if you're smart, if you know what you're doing, uh, yeah. But uh, again, now I've been going to Monterrey for years, and uh, I got such family resistance to going back, you wouldn't believe it, and there's a reason for that. Uh, Monterrey, which was one of the safest places in Mexico, you know, 10 years ago, was one of the most dangerous ones today. Now, hopefully, that'll turn around. It's become the center of the methamphetamine. Not to do with? With uh, many children and like poor families becoming soldiers. Well, the child soldier thing is, has several dimensions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I found families in Colombia that literally, uh, these were not usually so much children. I mean, these were teenagers at least, you know, at 60. You know, who'd have one kid in the guerrillas, one in the paramilitaries, and one in the army. You know, as a, as a way of keeping the family at least a little insulated. Uh, it was. A lot of the child soldiers are forced into it. Some of them are just orphans. Their parents have been murdered. The people who murder them may take them in. There's a there's a TV, there's a documentary that shows up every now and then on the documentary channel uh, on Liberia, which is a fascinating one called the Redemption Redemption of General Butt Naked. You had a lot of interesting generals in Liberia. One of them was General Peanut Butter, for example. Butt Naked was. Uh, you know, who was one of the worst in terms of, you know, and then, and then gets converted and becomes an evangelist, but, but literally goes around begging for forgiveness and trying to help the people he forced. Um, but a lot of these were forced in. A lot of them just, it was the only thing they could do to survive. I mean, this is, it's, it's, I don't think you find many families sending their kids, they're, 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 they're 12, 13, 14 years old. There's, there was a wonderful cover on the bulletin of the, Journal of Atomic Scientists, one that ran that clock about how far we were from nuclear doomsday. But a few years ago it ran and it had, uh, it said, what is the most dangerous weapon system in the world? And inside I had a picture of a barefoot, semi a probably illiterate kid with an AK-47. It said, you know, you know, a teenager with an automatic weapon. I mean, this is, think, it's, how they, and, and why do they stay? Well, first of all, maybe no place to run away, and those who may try probably got killed. Secondly, you develop ties with the guys you're with, you know, which is often, you know, you're not fighting for, for any particular cause. You're fighting for survival. You're fighting because your buddy's fighting, and you need, you know, it's, and, and, and it's not, there's a fair amount of female child soldiers here, more than people generally realize. It's not a, you know, they may only be about 10%, but that's a heck of a lot of them when you start adding it up. Uh, it's, so it's not even gender specific, is that it does. Uh, it, it's, and when the wars just go on and on and on, it's, 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 there's, a, there's a couple of good books about African kids who got, Dallas, you remember the titles of a couple of these? Or? You know what I'm talking about, though. Yeah, this is, you know, this, this was in the Sudan, this is, this is everywhere. And it was in El Salvador, too, as a major problem. It really was. And uh, what do you do with these guys afterwards? Uh, yeah. Yeah. May, they may have gotten through two or three grades of school. Yeah. You're going to take a guy who's been out killing people for the last five years, and now he's, he's 16, and put him in the third grade? I don't think so. <laughs> I wouldn't want to meet him on the playground. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you talked about that. Political science classes here, so we're, we're learning about realism and uh, other yeah, philosophies. Yeah. So, from a realist perspective, you're talking about military might being power. So, if you have individuals who are being disarmed, um, do you think that that contributes to uh, a feeling of helplessness and perhaps opening themselves up to exploitation by the corrupt police, by corrupt governments? Well, that, that basically you're taking away from them the uh, the military or the 
violence capacity that they have, while other countries around here uh, are the ones dictating to them what they need to be doing. Oh, it's usually, I mean, you, you try to make this a domestic, and their own leaders are telling them, their own commanders are, you know. So um, remember, most of these guys want to quit fighting at this point, you know, partly because you know, continuing fighting gives them a very short life expectancy. Yeah, what they've seen about war does not make them want to do this forever. Yeah, it is, it is, this, it is this phenomena of an inculcated culture of violence, along with a degree of aversion. And you know, how how do you meld these two things? So, and they already are to an extent powerless. I mean, this is you know they they yeah you know, they the uh, they have a certain degree of power as long as they've got the gun. But they have a huge degree of vulnerability, including to those above them. And, you know, they can be shot at any moment for anything. <laughs> I mean, this is. I, uh, when it comes to the whole idea of powerlessness, I'll, I'll never forget an encounter I had uh, with a, 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 a Jesuit priest. It happened to be a, from the United States, but you know, in some of the worst slums of Mexico. About, oh, good grief! Thirty years ago. Uh, I was looking at some of the you know, radical priests in Latin America. And he was very interesting. He was talking about it there, you know, and he said, you know, I live in this, I work with these people, I don't understand poverty. I don't understand what it really is, because it's ultimately powerlessness. He says, look, I, I'm here, but I'm here by choice. None of them are. You know? Tomorrow, if I wanted to, I could walk out of this, go to the U.S. Embassy, they'd call my family, and they'd fly me home. I have an escape. They have none. You know? It's like, pardon me, with these silly things about, let, let's go have a poverty meal and see what it's like. You don't know what it's like because you did it by choice, and tomorrow you're going to have whatever you want to eat. It is power. And he said, this is, he said, the idea that some of this ennobles people is the silliest idea I've ever seen. It just, you know, it just, you know they, they beat up, you know, their, their wives who beat the kids who kick the dog. <laughs> um, it's... It is hopelessness and power. It is life without hope and without much of a future. You know? And restoring hope, which is actually part of the keys of the DDR process, uh, although you, you can't exactly have a typical government program called, you're going to, we're going to re rebuild hope here. You know? this is, you know, hope like political will is not an exportable commodity. I mean, this is, yeah, it's, 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 powerlessness is part of the key to real, honest poverty. And it's something that bluntly virtually nobody here understands. I mean, you know, I didn't grow up in a rich family, but there wasn't a day in my life when I couldn't get up and go to the refrigerator and find something to eat. <laughs> Powerlessness is, you know, in the morning you don't know if your kids have lunch. <laughs> it's, it is something that is, we, I, I understand how profound it is, and emotionally I really don't understand it. I mean, you know, I can't. Like I said, if I put myself in the position of that priest, I'd be there voluntarily with a way out. None of them are. It's, um, I've, as we talked about all this, I just can't help but think, look at the inner cities of our own country. Oh, yeah. We can't solve the problems here. How are we going to solve them for them? That's what I'm saying. Right. Who's going to go and say, "Give me money for jobs in another country"? Right. Um, I mean, it's everything you mentioned can, is in. Urban we, 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 you know, the 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 powerlessness is notably less. There are options. People may not be very aware of them. Once you get, you know, there there is a sense of no future here, which is the same thing you find there. You know, you don't expect to live on something, live past 25. So, you know, don't tell me how bad drugs are going to be for me when I'm 40. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, uh, yeah, it is it, it 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 is a problem everywhere, and it's a it's a multi, it is a political problem, it is a social problem, it is a psychological problem. Uh, it's, but what we're trying to do here, in the world, and in a sense, some of what we need to do in our inner cities you know, is what's called, and this, this is the title of, of Colonel Chajic's latest book, you know, Building a Sustainable and Durable Peace. How do you keep the conflicts from re -eroding? How do you let these countries begin to rebuild? You know, how do you create the formula on which you can build something? How do you make this sustainable? No, you're not going to begin to solve it. Yes, there's going to be an awful lot of suffering. Yes, there's going to be a lot of you know, partial successes and repeated frustrations. 
But the point is, you know, how do you have people begin to think that maybe the future will be better for my kids than it is for me? And that's the key. When they start thinking that, things change. When they don't believe that, nothing changes. So it's as much about rebuilding attitudes as it is. Yeah, it, 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 money. It, 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 but you, you know, when I was a little kid, I loved my, my mother, a very wise woman. And she, you know, when I I do something wrong, I'd make excuses. I'm sure none of you ever did that, but I, was, you know. And my mother would look at me and she'd say, Richard, your actions speak so loud I can't hear a word you say. <laughs> Boy, is that the truth, be it in for domestic governments, for the U.S., for, you know, our actions speak so loud nobody hears what we say. Uh, very wise saying it is. I had a very wise, my grandfather, you know, who we talked about how he went through high school in the front door and out the back, uh, <laughs> once observed that, you know, if our foresight was as good as our hindsight, we'd be better off by a damn sight. Uh, I, uh, I quote that one a lot, too. <laughs> it's, and he's absolutely right. You know, it's, you know, you could look back and say, we should have seen that bus coming, but we don't. You know, you're so preoccupied with the tyranny of the urgent, with the problem of today. That's what I'm saying. You, know, you, you get the war over with, and maybe these guys at least demobilize or something, and then something else comes up, and we, we forget it. We go away and look someplace. I mean, look at Afghanistan. You know, oh, it's all solved. Let's go to Iraq. Everybody who knew the place said, you're out of your mind, you know. But uh, being out of your mind is a Washington habit. I mean, this is, you know, this, it, is, it is the tyranny of the urgent. And there's not much of it. The, the media reinforces that, but it doesn't create it. Yeah. It is the soundbite culture where everything can be explained in two minutes. And the result, of course, is that nothing can be. Maybe there are no parallels to developed countries, but the troubles in Ireland went on for a very long yeah. time, and now the DDR process appears to be working. That's one of the places where the women really got involved and said, quit it. But, we learn was, first of all, that? all the violence in, in Ireland never did much to the infrastructure. I mean, it hurt tourism in Northern Ireland. Yeah, but that, you know, the, the this infrastructure was there. Uh, it was the economy. It was part of the European economy. You know, the Irish, incredibly, <laughs> made some big mistakes once they got things going, and uh, they're paying for it now. But they weren't the only ones. And, I hear they're learning to speak Greek, but that's another story. Oh. Uh, you, know, it, uh, you know, this is, it, it, we forget how bad Ireland's situation. And one of the things was property values. They were selling everything to, to American Irish who wanted to go back, and suddenly we didn't have the money to go back. And it, it's, the world economy is so interlinked now. It, but yeah, the Irish case was religious, but it wasn't so much ethnic. It was, and it was solvable. It was solvable because people said, violence gets us nowhere. And because you were able to marginalize the more extreme groups. That can happen. The, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church was not endorsing you know, the, the violent rings of the IRA. That was very important. Yeah. And despite people like Ian Paisley, most of the Protestant churches weren't endorsing the Irish. Many, you know, this was, you know, but in some of these countries, it is precisely the religious establishment. Uh, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, whom we happened to have here at SIU last month, has an article in Newsweek last week or the week before, very interesting on this, you know, pointing out again, you know, that it's a small minority that gets all the news, but why governments are afraid of them, who is it, and that this stuff is, it looks religious, but it's exploited for a political agenda over and over and over again. And, and we are, talk about a human trait. We always think it's about us, you know? Oh, whatever they said, it's about us. They're using us as an excuse for a domestic political, you know, 90% of the time it's not about us, it's about something domestic. But uh, we gotta think it's about us uh, because obviously the world revolves around me. Uh, well, maybe not you, but it does me. <laughs> One last question. Somebody have a last question? Anybody still awake? Did you don't have one? I want my students to ask you questions. <laughs> there we go, see? Uh, what would you say is the way forward? Is it NGOs, grassroots organizations, the governments finally realizing this is important, you can't just leave? Uh, well, first of all, hopefully the global economy will begin to improve and that will make things a little better. 
And secondly, one thing you do discover, and by Central America, this was this was this was fascinating. We had what I call a sea change in history. Again, the advantage of being a historian, you know, for from the, the day of independence until through the Contra Wars, there were always major political groups who thought fomenting violence in their neighbor was beneficial for them. One thing everybody learned in the 80s, no. <laughs> it's just, now in this economy, it's disastrous. If your neighbor's at war, nobody, no tourists come, nobody invests, your trade gets disrupted. You know, they suddenly learned that, wait a minute, I've got an interest not in making my neighbor at war, but in trying to make it work. Those attitudes spread slowly, but they spread. As I said, and there's exhaustion by a lot of the fighters, no matter how bad, no matter, you know, no matter how they may get desperate and you know and result of you know, but they don't romanticize this anymore. Nobody romanticizes these wars, you know. The idea that, you know, justice comes through violence was a wonderful idea for some people in the 70s and 80s. You know, and belongs in the garbage can of history. If violence produces injustice, it produces more violence. <laughs> and we learned that at a terrible cost. Um, so these kinds of things point to the future. It's going to be a very long, it's going to be partial successes and repeated frustrations. The key thing is can we keep these things from rearranging? Dallas, you had a comment? What should we do in Syria? Huh? What should the U.S. do in Syria? Well, we can't do anything until after the election. <laughs> and then there's a lot of things, including, of all things, re-examining some drug law, including, you know, the UN has huge problems and failures and huge potentials and necessities. Uh, I remember being at an international conference where the element, and, and, and this was in England, we're about 30 countries there, and the ultimate conclusion was, A, we've never needed the UN more than we need it today. B, you know, it's not up to the task it has. And C, the chances of reforming it so that it can be up to the task are minimal. <laughs> Talk about a depressing conclusion. Well, I think we've got to alter that equation. That's going to take, you know, it, it, it takes, it takes some changes in, in, in our political climate where we stop, you know, looking for, you know, everything to attack each other and finding some cases None of us want our kids to grow up in a world that's evolving the way this one is. So what can we do to stop it? We do have that in common. Maybe if we focus on that a little bit, maybe, maybe things can work out a little bit. Thank you very much.